An intellectual carrot, the mind boggles. You see? You see? Your stupid minds. Stupid! Stupid! Earth has had Santa Claus long enough. We will bring him to Mars. I've been afraid a lot of times in my life. But I didn't know the real meaning of fear until... until I had kissed Becky. One thing will be clear. It's not for man to interfere in the ways of God. It's alive. Oh, it's alive. It's alive. It's alive. <laughs> Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Earth vs. Soup, episode 162. I'm Aaron Polyak. And I'm Darlene. We ended up, well, Darlene ended up recommending this because she kept seeing it. Yes. She kept seeing it in where? On my uh, reader. As a recommendation? Yes. Okay. And it is Things to Come from 1936. Or H.G. Wells things to come okay because it, it would, it's based on the the novel things to come the shape of things to come and the screenplay was actually written by hg wells. wells so this is like an actual hg wells thing here um this is an interesting movie i think this has a lot of this is going to have a, like a lot of positives and negatives and i'm going to start with a negative here so i can explain how we're going to talk about this movie the movie has a plot and it is good but the, it is like in three separate acts that are only barely held together and because of that even though these three acts take you know actually tell the story because of that the characters that are in each of these acts are only also loosely connected And therefore, you don't have time to really know the characters very well, so they become archetypes. So, in my notes, I don't think I have a single character name. Um, I do in some of mine. Okay. But they're in two different, of you calling it, acts. Two different acts. There's three different acts. Yeah, but the same character is in two Yes, okay, that's true. That's true. Um, what you're calling X. Um, I would say the main character is humanity. Yes. This is also a movie. In some ways, it's a post-apocalyptic movie. It is a post-apocalyptic movie. And I see lots of connections to later science fiction. So, I mean, a lot of connections to later science fiction. This movie, even that, though we're going to rag on parts of it. That is the only reason I would recommend this to be seen is because it has effects that to see this, you can see other things in it. Yeah. Th- I mean, even though this is 1936, this has, um, this is like a big rock being thrown into a small pond. The, it, the ripples it makes in science fiction are felt today. So there's things that feel very modern. But in there's this also various things that feel very 1936. Oh yeah. Because of what takes place very beginning is a Christmas supposed to be in like 1940s. Um, it is Christmas 1940. So it's four years in the future from when this movie was made. And they're worried about war. Yes. Now, This is the thing. It it actually is fairly accurate with some of the, some of its predictions. It, it was considered so accurate that it was actually re-released in 1940 at Christmas, 1940 in England during the war, because it predicted the war fairly quickly. I mean, you say, oh, well, it's easy to predict things four years in the future. No, not really. But what it did predict is, um, indiscriminate bombing of urban centers. It does describe aerial warfare. Correct. It describes casualties, which is one I of mean, the civilian things that, casualties that really hits you in the first act, the end of the first act, really. Yeah. So okay. So yeah, it is Christmas time. The first act is Christmas time, nineteen forty. 
and we're introduced to a family. Three families. Three actually. families. And see, this is where it, it comes across as that these, um, they're not really characters, they're archetypes. You have like the concerned father uh, for his daughter. You have the doofy guy, the doofy father who has the young son. That's very optimistic. That's very optimistic about the future. And then you have the scientist. The scientist's son who is who who thinks that he thinks that war is not a bad thing for progress because war uh, while the older guy that has the daughter that's worried about the war he's like war stifles progress stifles scientific um innovation uh, and it's terrible. And the, the, the younger guy is like, well, yes, no, war is terrible. Absolutely. But it promotes progress in certain things, in, in certain aspects. Which is true. Which is true. It, that is also true. And when they had this scene, because he's like a doctor, he's actually like a medical doctor. I thought for sure that, see, I've never seen this movie before. I thought for sure they were going to go and show that medical technology had been progressed very quickly because of war, because of treating soldiers, having to figure out new techniques to treat wounds and all of that. Okay. So what happens is war does break out and we end up getting some things that actually seem a little too close to the blitz to be comfortable. Well, the the character that I have written down here is as John Campbell, and he goes Cabal. in Cabal. He goes into the Royal Air Force as a pilot. Yes, and he's the one we see. And after all the bombarding of every town. Yeah, the, yeah. You see, here's the, the the main town that everything takes place in. It's called Every Town, and it, it, it's London. Okay, that that's what it, it comes across as. It's not London, but it's London. Um, there's mountains nearby, but it's London. Okay. And at the end of the scene of the bombing in the, of the square, you see a little boy dead in the rumble rubble of the rum rubble rubble <laughs> of the street, and he's the same boy that was. He's the son, the the like six year old son of the guy that was the friend of cabal yes okay and he was the optimist like his father was the optimist yes, saying, don't worry son pepe we're just, i'm just gonna go off to war and we're going to stop the bad guys and and we're going to celebrate peace right away and this is where i paused the movie for a second and i said to darlene i now know that this movie is going to take a dark turn and it, it, when he went whistling away from the sun, and yeah, it sure as hell does because his son's found in the rubble after the initial bombing. And it suddenly becomes a post-apocalyptic apocalyptic movie because... Um, you have thousands and thousands of plan, planes going over Dover. Yeah. And then you have people grabbing gas mask for poison. And you have John come in uh, he shoots down an enemy pilot and um, he goes to rescue the enemy pilot that crashed down. Which seems weird to me that he would do that, but he does it. But he does it and the enemy pilot then gives the gas mask because there's a little girl there. Yeah, oh, gas and is he being takes, used in this war and he, it's awful. He takes the little girl in his biplane yeah to rescue her and rescue and the her. german well I, yeah because he's german it's it's pretty clear that he's german right he's he he kind of like laughs at the irony of it that i probably just killed this girl's family or i might have killed this girl's family in the bombing and i just gave her my gas mask and i'm dying because of it isn't that ironic no no it means that you actually have a little bit of a soul a little bit of one you then you go through this parade of 1945 in all the war 1955 all the war the war Nin does not end yeah world war ii 1960 does not end. then you get a newspaper that comes up september 21st 1966 
it's it costs four pounds. Yeah, so that's incredibly. And it says amount. end is in sight. You probably have the full. Yeah, the end is in sight. Victory is coming. You know, there we still have airplanes, um, but our enemies are still using poison gas. And now that they they are um, now there's a plague sweeping the land. And they call it like the wandering plague, the wandering, wandering sickness, the wandering sickness. And it's not very it's not clear if this was a purposeful biological warfare or if it was just plague. And they show the first the first time you see a victim of this plague, he's coming out of something that is a hospital, you know, I, in every town that's got word word written in in like chalk or something hospital he's coated with sweat no shirt yeah he he looks thin emaciated um there's people still living in every town but every town is rubble it's rubble and the the guy that becomes the boss Mm -hmm. tells somebody to shoot him Mm -hmm. and this becomes prevalent that they're shoot now gonna be shooting the sick they're executing the six to stop the plague from spreading okay but we're also introduced dr harding here and this is like the one time i actually have something written down as a name um dr harding is doing research and he's doing research on the wandering plague to try to stop it and he's like i need iodine and his nurse is like we have just we don't have any more you use the last of it and he freaks freaks out he's like we're done we're done as a civilization if we don't even have medicine anymore that the only thing that is really being made anymore are bullets that's about the only thing that's being made it looks like that even agriculture is very limited he is in in his his daughter is in Rags. Uh, rags they're all in rags and even the the only thing that looks like they've got decent clothes happens to be the soldiers so uh we, we also now see another sick woman rise from bed walks out walks and, out and gets gunned down in the street because and she's, her brother gets gunned down as yeah. well because he tells them don't shoot the guy that's the boss shoots him, has, has has him shot has him shot and then shoots the guy who isn't sick mm-hmm. well because he was around her that's kind of the point that he's most likely infected so then we get like another text crawl across the screen screen that basically says 1970 um there was a 1967 as well yeah but half the population <clears throat> of earth dies from the wandering plague and it goes to 1970 mayday and- and and every town basically seems like it is now a medieval society Mm -hmm. there is some horrific stuff that actually made me again pause the movie and i went that's a little too real that's a little too real and it was the car without wheels running on a rolls royce on hubs with being pulled by horses. horses big um big Clydesdales something like that and I said I've actually seen that in 2010 and I won't say where I've seen that in real life not a Rolls Royce though not a Rolls Royce but I've seen that in real life in a pretty pretty rough situation and it just felt way too real to me and the guy that's like in it is so happy that he has this car he's like i remember when this ran when i was a little kid we could do 300 miles in a day in a day and he and and everyone like there's there's people that are stopping like younger people that are stopping in the street to listen to this like there isn't even radio anymore then you have that thing with the uh one of the gordon i do remember him gordon because he's the uh, the pilot that is now a mechanic that they call all the pilots mechanics okay so every town is ruled by a warlord called the boss or the chief it's kind of interchangeable and, and he's, his, the, he's the guy that was ordering everybody shot that was sick about four years for ago every now. every for every town every town and there's also a group called the hill people yeah but they're just outside 
of town. And they're the ones that every town is going constantly after. Yes. And I don't really understand why, because it turns out that every time we see the hill people, they're effectively medieval peasants. Like, so is every how, town. Well, no. Every town has machine guns and rifles. The The hill people have like a couple rifles and spears. Like, this isn't a war. This is a slaughter. And the boss wants those planes to fly, but they have no petro. Yeah, so he's like, I'm going to take this shale and oil area from the hill people, and we're going to get you your petrol, and I'm going to have these planes. Because it's been years since, like, the last airplane had been seen uh, near every town. Now, it, it, it quickly becomes apparent that the chief, while he's wearing a military uniform, is a petty warlord. That there is no centralized government anymore. That basically every town is a city-state. And this guy is a petty dictator that at the very least seems competent enough to have held a large city. like. But you time. get the, here's where I always let a uh, thing. When you look at history, everyone that becomes like very dictatorship also ends up being insane. He's not insane. He's not insane. He goes insane at the end. At the very end, yeah, because he sees his entire plans fall apart. He's a product, remember, he's a product of more than 30 years of war. He's but so likely, is Harding. He likely has never seen anything but war. Dr. Harding? Dr. Harding? No. He was the young guy at the beginning that was optimistic about war allowing progress. He remembers a time without war. The chief doesn't. Okay. Now, the chief, is, while I can't say is crazy, he's clearly helped in his governance of this area by his wife, um, Roxana, who's played by Mar Margarita Scott. And, and we both, without talking to each other, like we started making comparisons with her to Sophie Aldred, the person who played ace the companion of the seventh doctor and doctor who it's a like, twitch that she makes with her face that... we, yeah we both thought that they were related like the actresses were related and i don't think they are we, we looked it up but yeah it's it was strange that we both saw that at effectively the same time because you looked at me and you said doesn't she look like ace and i said yeah she did and he and then she made that facial twitch and he, right there and i go yeah you're right that's that's interesting. I wonder if they like uh, work together at one point, maybe. And I don't know. It, it was it was weird. Anyway, she wears like sovereigns, <laughs> um, pound coins on chains and things like that to show her wealth and power. And anyway, Cabal comes out and lands a plane. Like he's flying a plane and he lands in every town, and it's a futuristic looking plane for 1930s it looks amazing like to us it looks like oh it's something from like maybe the late 40s but i mean it was futuristic for the time and he comes out and he's in this dumb looking space suit looking thing. If I, we find out later it's a gas mask that he's wearing yeah it's like a full body <clears throat> it's basically a spacesuit to <clears throat> keep out gas because people are still using poison gas um and he says take me to your leader oh wait a second hold on uh are there anybody, is there anybody alive that I used to know? Um, can you take me to, to the Hardings? Okay, yeah, there's a Dr. Harding. And they start talking like, hey, look, uh, I'm... Uh, you're under arrest. You're under arrest. Yeah, you're under arrest, buddy. You're going to come and talk to the chief. And the, he basically, Cabal says to the chief after a little bit, he goes, look, I don't care about this, this dictatorship. My organization doesn't care about it. And he's like, you need to help me. <laughs> Um, get my airplanes working again. And he's like, yeah, I, I absolutely will, but they're not your airplanes. And uh, my, my organization doesn't believe in private ownership of attack airplanes anymore. And, and he goes, they're not privately owned. They're a public good. And, and this is where I'm they're, like, I'm a, so uh, this is a sovereignty. Yeah. This is a sovereign nation, et cetera, et cetera. And again, it is 
not there is no central government there is no central government there's no government this is just it is petty dictatorship but again i'm not sure obviously this guy isn't a good guy i'm just not sure if the chief is the worst of the worst like he's not stringing people up in the streets he's not being like he's not being like a mad max villain let's put it that way like he he honestly seems to think that by conquering the people nearby that he'll bring peace to every town now, i'm not trying to say i'm justifying his his behavior because he is kind of a petty dictator anyway he throws um cabal in jail and cabal says hey you're gonna you're gonna let me go otherwise my people are gonna come and look for me and when they come and look for me there's gonna be problems and well what are they called well we're called wings over the world i guess and we're gonna bring peace to the world and well where are you based and i thought that he said glasgow but it's not it's somewhere on the european continent that they're at okay so anyway um there's a couple uh, we're skipping over tons of dialogue, but the thing is the dialogue isn't really that important to the plot. It's just exposing ideas that HG Wells had about society that a democratic society is a good society that a dictatorship is bad, that war is bad. We should all try for peace and science will bring salvation to us all. Anyway, <clears throat> wings over the world sure as hell does come after after uh he's basically after cabal is forced to make some airplanes functional again um one of the pilots the mechanic quote unquote that you said he flies to wings over the world and says hey look they've they captured cabal uh i'm not an enemy gordon yeah gordon I, yeah gordon the guy that's that's the pilot he goes I, they captured him uh i don't want to die i'm not your enemy you need to go rescue him and here's how here's the forces that the chief has They're like no problem we got this we have gas and it turns out they have something called peace gas now i i i rolled my eyes okay because it's still a gas it's not really poison what does it do darlene when they fly over they drop it it knocks everybody out. That's all it does is it knocks everybody out. Oh, it kills the chief. No, the Which... chief dies because he can't handle peace. And since it's called peace gas, it's symbolic. Oh, that's where the connection is. Yeah, that the chief actually never wanted peace um, and he dies. But anyway, the peace gas just seems to like pacify everyone even after they wake up. So I guess it's like Prozac or mind control gas. I don't know regardless regardless everyone kind of stumbles around and your wings over the world guys basically take over civilization um and then mine the earth yeah they basically start they basically start what's the best way there's there's a technological progress uh, montage that happens they start saying, well, we're going to rebuild the earth from the inside out. Um, the surface is toxic with all this gas and poison, and there's nothing really left for us on the surface. So they're going to hollow out the mountains of the earth and live inside. And I'm thinking, okay, so we're going old Morlock here because this is HG Wells. We already know what the time machine is, right? But no, that's not exactly the case they do hollow out mountains and they effectively build giant arcologies inside in this montage and it's actually a very cool montage but it does have open space it has large open spaces inside and artificial sunlight that one of the people in 2036 now says that basically the age of windows where people used windows to see the outside and have light lasted for 400 years and we ended that because now we have our own sunlight and they have flat screen televisions that educate the young and i was like okay that's actually really cool and this young girl is looking at the screen seeing like an old movie of new york city and she's like the pre-war buildings look so strange they're like inside out 
And it's because, again, that these arcologies are built so that the things reaching upwards are the open spaces. That their open spaces are the things that are tall and reach up towards the roof, rather than buildings which people live inside that go up into the open sky, right? I thought that was kind of fun that she was like, the, the, they live inside out, which is, like I said, funny. The I don't costumes know. of the future. The costumes of the future are future. This is like 1930s future. I would say it's a mix of Buck Rogers and Japan, like Japan samurai type stuff with the weird um I, I don't know how shoulders. they got the... Uh the shoulder pads of those things. Can I say in black and white though, the little girl's costume looked flesh toned and I thought she was topless for a second. You did too. Okay. So it wasn't just me I, in black and white. It looked, I had to, I, I double tape, you know, I went, Oh, Oh, okay. No, we're okay. We're okay. But then we go to the sculptor. that's oh. making this big skull sculpt. And I said, 2036 crap. No, they're 20 years late on this crap. But it was basically a, a big chunk of their society are Luddites. Um, that's what I call them. Um, yeah, but there's a sculpture called... That's what called... Wikipedia calls them. Oh, see, I, I, just, I just said right away, oh, he's a Luddite because he's afraid of technological progress. He wants to stop progress so we can have happy time. Yeah, because the old times were good. You know, we need we need to make our society great again. So we can have happiness. So he wants to basically tear down society and all the progress that's been made that basically everyone's everyone is happy except this small portion of people that think breathing poison gas and having to scrounge for food. Wearing were, rotting clothes. Were the good old times. And things were better. God, I, it, not having I'm not going to get into politics in. on this, but it's. It was, again, it got a little too real for a second. It got a, a little too real. Then you have real. this wonderful thing called a space gun. There's a space gun. And he basically, this, this Luddite piece of shit, excuse my language, because if there is a villain in this movie, it is this guy. And let's not go into politics. But this guy was a villain. He basically goes on television, riles people up, lies to people um gets people on his side by basically trying to vilify the other people and tear down the it is, people that are it's a little in charge that's trying to bring, trying to help bring progress progress trying to like hey look there's no disease anymore but you want to bring back disease don't you and he's like yes because science has prevented us from being human and and no, science is allowing you to do exactly what you want, you piece of shit. You're out there being able to carve sculptures. That's his job is he's a sculpture carver. That do you would you rather be Even the president at that point says that. Yeah, he's him. like our society allows you to perform your art. Without our society, you would be hard scrabbling outside in the radioactive waste. And you're wanting to tear all of this down, you piece of shit. Regardless, since the war happened, and this is this is an interesting thing, the space gun, they're going to launch this rocket to the moon because no one's been to the moon yet. It's 2036, and that made me a little sad. And this young guy comes up to the president and asks him to be one of the people. And he goes, well, there needs to be two. And he goes, well... Somebody closer than me to you, to you wants to go, wants to go. And he says, Christine, which is the president's daughter. daughter. And he's like, well, if I can't, she's her own person. She's an adult. And if I'm not willing to make a sacrifice of my own family, because it, this, this mission is going to be dangerous, right? If I'm not willing to make a sacrifice for my own family, I can't ask anyone else to do that. So I'll, that's fine. If she wants to do it, she can. And she does. And she does. And the father of the the, the guy mm -hmm. is brainwashed with the Luddite. Yeah. So he has all those. And you know, it's not his beliefs. It's just him. He's parroting things that he's heard, heard. on, on um, Eagle News, let's say. And... 
God, this movie gets a little too real. Again, I keep saying that, but it it's hard to watch at times because again, every like even it doesn't matter which act it is. Is it, you know, the beginning of the war? Is it post-apocalypse? Is it this? There's things that we've seen within the past decade with our own eyes that are in this 1936 movie. I mean, crazy. Anyway, um, the Luddites decide that they're just going to go and bang on the outside of this um, outside of this rocket launch facility. I made a joke that it was uh, similar to all, all the, the Frank Universal, and, Universal Frankenstein movies. movies with a mob. The mob storms the important facility with uh, on on the important day where it's actually going to do its work. Again, God, I don't want to... Okay, you let, know exactly what the let, allusion is to modern history. Okay, let me go this way. The first thing that you... The don't pre- talk about politics, though. Pre- president says to them, this is dangerous. You guys caught to... Because it's going to have a pressure The wave. blast wave from this gun going off will kill you all. It is going to go up at whatever. And they keep and charging. They just keep charging it because... They don't give a crap. They don't believe that science is real. And they just want to destroy so this. So there's thousands of people. This guy. This. Uh, oh, he's there. He's in the front lines. He's. He's a murderer of. He's a mass murderer. He's like, mass- look, we can't. You guys. We warned everybody to stay away. Um, If you're wanting to bang on the outside of this thing with sticks. It's a giant cannon with like a barrel, thirty feet thick of steel, right? And the little, um, the little uh, pod that they're in, the two are in, is it, that's thicker than I've seen a uh, a bank vault be. I know it's and he, and they're like banging away at this, and they're like, "Okay, guys, we we freaking warned you!" Boof, boof, everyone dies. They, well, don't, they show don't show it. it. They don't show it. The, but... that, then you go to the president and the... And the, the president's not really upset. He's just like, well, I guess that problem took care of itself, huh? <laughs> that is not what that's he said. That's not what he said, but that's what I said. <laughs> and I go, well, that societal problem's taken care of. All, all the morons just went out and got themselves killed by storming the... Uh... Stupid needs to die by stupid. But anyway... Uh... The end, basically. There's a little speech at the end, and it actually is. And you love it. I actually loved it because it was about how humanity has to look forward. And it's because we are animals. So we can do one of two things. We can resort to our base instincts and look inwards and not towards other people to understand both ourselves and others. That we become nothing better than the animals that surround us. Right. Or we can look upwards and outwards. Did he say something about a mouse? Yeah, we can be meek like mice and fear everything. Or we can look forward and outwards to the future, towards others, and to become... embrace others, to embrace the future, to embrace progress, to embrace other ideas. So... There is a lot of ideas in this thing. There's a lot of political. See, no, no, no I wouldn't say at the politi- time it was not political. If you watch this today, you can't help but have the political. But it kind of was political if you watched, if you, you put it ten, even ten, a decade into his future. When did he write that book? That I don't novel? know. It, 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 I don't. I don't remember. The point is, is that that Wells has always been a person that I've looked up to for this kind of idealism in his books. But he also understood humans would have some problems. Yes, and that's and why that's I looked really up to what he's showing in this is the the we keep going back to go forward. There's always going to be a portion of humanity that wants to be destructive that wants to be that wants to implode society and control wa- society and control society for their own petty gains like torquemada like the chief in this, yeah the chief who is terrified of 
of Losing. anyone that's even slightly different. Like here, here, here's the hill people outside that are literally the same people that live inside every town. The only difference is, is that they have spears and you have machine guns. You outclass them entirely. The only difference is, is that they have oil and you need it. Again, the 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 That's... insane the insane connections to modern history is That's Iraq and Iran. And... Yeah, but and it's so hard. See what when when I was watching this, I kept I kept saying to myself when we record this. Is he Nostradamus? No, no, when when we record this, I'm gonna have to do my best to just keep saying I don't want to talk about politics, but the politics of this movie in modern history are crystal clear. The, 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 the connections you can make to modern history. Now, obviously Wells did not know a hundred years in the future, he, what this would 1936, be. 1936. There was a whole bunch of disgruntled. There was the depression. There was disgruntled people when he wrote time machine about progress and industrialization that wanted the good old days before machines. Well, the word Luddite comes from a, what's his name? Lud. Yeah, well, Hun Lun Lud. sabotage sa sabo. And you know, he shoes. he he was against the fiber industry because he was a a weaver. Wells is a genius of a writer, and it always has been. We we can't. Yeah, it's going to hurt some people. But progress is needed for us to step forward. But part of that progress is caring about the people who are hurt by it. And he even makes a point of that. It's like, we don't want to leave anyone behind. But when you're dragging your feet and biting the hand that's holding yours, it makes it really hard for us to go, the people that are in progress, you know, that want to progress. It makes it really hard for us not to go, okay, we're, we're going to use the happy gas on you because after a while words fail when you when the other person when when, about... when when the chief doesn't want to use words and only wants to use force and you keep trying to talk to him and talk reason to him and only his wife is listening to reason remember yep he doesn't give a crap because she's the one that got uh, that saved uh harding yeah and his daughter from being killed by because the... she actually cared she cared about the future and, and she made a point of kind of explaining why that there was this gender. Um, how, how do I explain it? That men and women have different outlooks on life. And I'm, I'm not sure if this is a, a very good argument to make. Probably back then it was. Yes. But you can see that like there are, there are differences in in general about gender roles. And in the 1930s, gender roles were much more distinct. Let's put it that way. So she was trying to make an argument based on gender role rather than actual gender about how gender roles tended to see the world and that women, i.e., you know, the mothering figures tended to care about the future where men just wanted to go out and punch each other in the face. And I'm like, well, that's not the best argument to make from a modern standpoint, but I understand what she's trying to say. I thought of the, the thought of how many men we have taking care of children today and circular logic is becoming easier for them. No, darling, not that is not an argument to be making. That's, that's false. It's more of that in a society that has progressed, gender roles become more meaningless. Well, correct. There's still they, the biological imperatives that are inherent in each gender, but but taking care of children, you have to think in a different way. Yes. Than the A gets to B to C to D. Yes, but is, does she, is she a mother? No, she's I don't not, know. She's not. She's not. She does you, not. This have whole movie. Anything. The only time you saw children was in that first part. There's children in in Act Two, but they're in the background. It's just that they didn't want to show children that kind of squalor because they thought it was a little too. And in three, it was only that little girl with the grandfather. Yes. But what I'm trying to say is that she was not implied to be a mother. She was implied to be a wife that was trying to care. She was the caring one. 
where the chief was just a dick that yes he had his his every town um the best intentions for every town that he, he actually did want he did want the best he wanted to actually have like at least he kept saying that i do want peace i want a free society but i don't think he understood what peace and a free society actually meant anymore because again like i said here's a guy that's probably only known war peace is likely the time between fights which i mean i guess it is but what i'm trying to say is like peace is the time between battles in the ongoing war where there is never truly peace it's just a time to sleep does that make sense like that might be the way he's thinking of peace. yeah but i even thought he was being kind of dictator like even when he wasn't the boss when he told that guy to shoot and that guy didn't want to well yeah the woman and he grabs the gun from him and shoots him and then shoots the it's the slippery slope though right like hey you can almost understand him making the order by saying like look f- medicine has failed us medicine has failed <laughs> We even have that argument at this point in in the movie with with medicine failing with Dr. But where they found they didn't go searching for medical stuff. All they did was search for bullets to shoot others. Yes. And I I got that 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 out of the woman. I'm saying it's 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 almost understandable for him to go. I'm going to shoot the six so they don't um infect everybody else because it looks it, it seems like it does it, it's not like it's airborne it's that it's touch based. it's touch based i can almost see the argument for it I, I don't because then you just isolate those people right you quarantine them but that that's the that's the moral thing to do right because i i don't think it it specifically says that it kills everyone that it infects it kills most people but not everyone anyway it's the slippery slope. Hey, look, I'm going to shoot, shoot uh, this person who is clearly infected and trying to touch somebody else. Right. It's a zombie type thing. I'm going to shoot this person. Yeah. there. It was very, but then he makes the step. Then he's like, no death by association. Shoot that person who's not infected just because they might be. That's the evil. That's like the slippery slope of saying, oh, well I can justify killing this person. So I'm going to kill another person it's the idea of kind of the, that fascist um, I'm better than these people or these people just don't deserve to live, even though there might not be anything wrong with them here. The Hill people are slightly different. They just live outside of every town. They're different enough that we should just go exterminate them for their oil. I mean, there's a lot of really. Well, that's world war two with uh, the Germans and uh, going for the oil fields. The, yeah. The, Anyway, Russian ball. this movie has um, unintentionally a lot of modern political links. So I'm going to... I don't know if we're putting those. Maybe. Movies. Well, no, obviously we, we are, are because it, this was written, you know, this movie was written in 1936. H.G. Wells wrote the screenplay. But then it could be said that history repeats itself. Yes, But regardless, we are putting the political connections here because it seems that they are very clear that you could link these things because they're very similar. Um, And they obviously have very similar links from the 1930s, because, again, we're already seeing like the rise of Nazism in in the 1930s, this kind of dictatorship, fascist dictatorships that are rising. And the scare of gas. Yep, exactly. Even though it didn't really happen in World War II. Except in but then the you get like, concentration camps. Then you get like the sickness. And you again see these modern kind of connections. But World War One, you had the Spanish uh, flu. The f- Spanish flu. So that's where he was. Yeah, obviously. But there's again another one of these links that we can make in a modern sense. So what I'm saying is, is that this movie is fantastic for many reasons. I think what works is that nearly everything about this movie works. So I think I actually need to start with what doesn't work. Characters don't matter in this, except like the chief, his wife, his wife and the pilot. You mean, um, Cobble, not the, the mechanic. No, 
there's three characters that matter in this the chief because he's the driving force between the uh for the evil in act two the pilot who is introduced in act one um cabal uh in act one and is the main force for good in act two and is a real uh, and then there's his grandson that's the president in act three yeah and played by the same character uh but played by the same actor but um outside of those like small notes and even then like is any of the dialogue really something that we wrote down besides like me saying, yeah, their speeches, this is like a stage play on screen. That is one thing I did say was this was this, this is written like it's a, and you yelled at me for criticizing. No, HG no, I did not. Well, cause I was like, this is written like it's a stage play. On how it's they written talk like and... a novel. Hmm. The dialogue is. It's a novel that's been adapted for stage. But it's not written like a novel. But it, it sort of is and sort it's of isn't. It's written Shakespearean-like. And the, the reason why I say it's written like <clears throat> a novel is that you have to assume the novel is written that has like dialogue said, you know, comma, said so-and-so. So you're reading their name and you're knowing who's speaking, where Wells is just assuming that you see the person, you know their name, you know exactly who they are or whatever, right? You're not constantly reminding about their name. Now, I'm not sure, because of that, I'm not sure I would say that Wells is a good screenwriter. Obviously, Wells is arguably one of the best science fiction writers of all time, of all time. And he wrote this very well. What I was referring to was the the small... They're not Shakespearean monologues, but they're monologues. What do I have in my hair? Sorry. <laughs> they're monologues. Um, yes. They're speeches, and they're good. They're and good. And your 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 sculpt your your radical luddite is very important too. Um. Yeah, but he's a piece of crap, and I don't ever want to see his face again. <laughs> um. Boy what else does not work in this movie? Like I would say like most of the characters don't matter at all. Like you could, you could do this as a stage play with three people or four people. You could. Yes. So most of the people, most of the, the characters don't really matter. Does anything else truly not work? Uh, no, because even the crappy costumes were, interesting it, it, they were they kind of put you to where what it was supposed to be and the crystal at the end there was like glass tables that they'd sit on and it was cool like oh yeah see okay the sets fantastic i don't the think they were fantastic i, I do for 1936 fantastic the, the model, model work fantastic for 1936 like the futuristic airplanes oh my god even the helicopter, darling, which was actually a gyrocopter. It's just a, it's a, it's a rear propelled gyrocopter. Fantastic. All the future tanks that look like 19, uh, 1930s, <laughs> like sleek cars, the future, you know exactly what I'm talking about. They look cool. Come on. No, they looked like something that you would have in Flash your Gordon. Flash and Gordon or what's that, uh, game that you like to pay flaw fallout. Yeah. That they the looked old, fantastic. The old 1950s. They were really cool. Um, the costumes, all the costumes, but I want to point out that the costumes in 1970, the post-apocalyptic 1970, especially the chief who has like that old British uniform on, he doesn't have the chest full of medals. He has like a couple medals, but he has like that fur cape and like a, a pith helmet. Well, like, you know, the, 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 an actual like world war one, trench helmet on yeah. that has like an, a, like a bent ornament on top. It's a feather with an ornament on it. Yeah. And it's, I'm like, this is really cool. Cause it's not stupid over the top. It's exactly what you would think a post-apocalyptic petty dictator would actually kind of have because every town is a slum. Yes. It's the ruins of a city, but it's not like he's incredibly wealthy. 
Like if I would have said there was one person that was wealthy in this town, it was his wife just because she had like the necklace of gold sovereigns. But he actually got food, drink and that more than others. Oh, yes, he did. He actually had clean water. Um, I would say everything else like in 2022, there are so many things in this movie that made me a little unsettled. And so I would say like what works in this movie is modern day, making me feel really uncomfortable watching parts of this. So being that there is so little that does not work in this movie before we started recording. I'm like, Darlene, would you recommend this movie? And you're like, no, I'm not going to recommend this. I said, you said yes, you would with one. With that. It is something that someone needs to see for, because it is something that affects a lot of other science fiction. And I would say I would recommend it because I think every part of it 90 95% of this movie is interesting, engaging, um, connected to modern day as well as the 1930s. Okay, the montage. I like the montage. The model work was fantastic in it. The back projection of science and industry rebuilding the earth with these really cool futuristic looking turbines and 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 earth movers and and rock like disintegrators and things like that, that, that actually looked like they were functioning and moving models that actually had like segmented joints in them. Okay. Oh, fantastic. Yes. I recommend it. Darlene, you're like a light recommendation. I'm a recommendation, not light, but just a recommendation that this is something that needs to be kind of watched. If you're interested in what, yeah, science what fiction. Science fiction is, and it's progress. What what I said right at the beginning of this review that this is, this is the big rock being thrown into the pond of science fiction. Like you can feel its ripples, even to today, in science fiction. You can, and um, I'm not saying that this is like in our top five movies that we've seen for Earth versus Soup. It isn't because I think that overall the character work in this is, is poor enough that it knocks it out of that. For it to be character based, which it's not, it's not the situation is the character. Yes. Humanity is the character. Humanity is the character. It's like everybody was talking about uh, Dun Dunkirk. Well, the character, there's like these, these aren't characters. characters. No, the character is the situation. Yeah. The actual movie is about, the situation not not the people the people are incidental they come and go in this so because this not is important. about the human aspect hum- of, of going into in through progress and that we can't keep sliding backwards yeah we can't keep looking down and uh navel gazing and then trying to think that the past was always good because it's not there can be good parts of it, but we should recognize those parts and also recognize the bad with it as well and go, well, can we take the good and then improve upon the bad? We should be able to. Can we take the pr- good and improve on the good? We should be and able to. And not repeat the bad. We should be able to, but again, that takes... We're humans. That takes an educated society. And remember the whole point of 1970 is no one knows how to read anymore. Only the old people know how to read. History like is repeating itself. Of, mm-hmm. of... History is repeating itself. History is being allowed to repeat itself because no one understands history anymore. No one understands the world. No one understands themselves. And that's the genius of Wells. Wells is a, an excellent writer. So we'll leave it there, folks. Since we're going almost on to an hour here. But that's okay. It's an actual long movie. It's an hour and a half. So I don't mind well, going to Well, that is hour. one of the things I was trying to talk to you about. Oh, there's, there's lots of different prints of this. Yeah, the uh, there's original one of 137 minutes. Yeah, but it's like lost to time. I don't know. There's lots of weird copies of this. Now, the, the version that we watched was on Amazon Prime. Prime. Yeah, and it was actually good. It was very good. It was good, clean quality. So, we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll leave it there. Um, I hope you enjoyed listening. I really did enjoy this movie. 
Um, I don't know what I was expecting, but that wasn't it. So okay. I, I'm Aaron. I'm Darlene. You have a good evening. And keep watching the skies. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought. Thanks for listening to this episode of This Week in Geek. Hungry for more? Check out our website at thisweekingeek.net. You can subscribe to the podcast, browse our Twitter and Instagram, and leave your thoughts on today's topics. If you'd like to give us some feedback, send us an email at feedback at thisweekingeek.net. Tune in next time, and remember, lower your shields and surrender your listenership. We would be honored if you would join us. Thank you for your cooperation. Good night.